the notion of open source began with the idea of source code of software being freely available. The story of this origin dates back to the second half of 20th century, when the world had just begun witnessing the rise of the software industry. We will learn more about this origin later in the course. Although the term open source had its roots laid in software, today it is an umbrella term which also includes concepts of open data and open standards among several others. In the context of open source software, free is defined better as in freedom, which means one has the freedom to access the source code, make changes to it and redistribute it as long as the associated rules are not violated. Open source in its purest and most fundamental essence is a guarantee of freedom, which pertains to software, designs, data, and all such entities. To be called open source software, there must be a finite set of laid down principles which have to be respected. These are called open source licenses. An open source license should regulate each open source software. A license defines the conditions of using, modifying, and redistributing the source code associated with the open source software. We will talk more about these licenses in detail later in the course. We should note the specific context of free here. It does not necessarily mean without cost or payment, but it tries to define the aspects of freedom to use modify and redistribute the source code. The Open Source Initiative is a non-profit corporation that defines and promotes the definition and the associated rules pertaining to open source software. These rules, when put together, make up the open source definition. You can learn more about this from the official website. Although the term open source was coined fundamentally from open source software, you should also note that in today's world, open source in its function is not just restricted to open source software. The term open source rather defines an idea, a practice and a methodology for the development of software and standards. In recent times, open source and its practices have led to some closely related concepts of open data and open innovation. To summarize, Open source software can be freely used. The freedom extends to usage, modification, and redistribution of the source code. Open source software is regulated under open source licenses. Some of the popular ones are MIT, GNU GPL, and FreeBSD. The term open source defines the practices, ideas, and methodology around open source software, standards, data, and innovation. Linux, Mozilla, Java, and Android are some popular examples of open source in action. Emergence of open source is relatively new and dates back to the late 1990s. The idea in principle was laid in universities and corporates of the second half of 20th century. Since software in all major cases came bundled with the hardware, the end users in many cases modified the source to fix bugs or iterate on the features offered. The A0 system of the 1950s is often considered one of the earliest attempts fostering the early essence of open source. The system was a compiler tool written by Grace Murray Hopper. One of the later iterations of the system, called the A2, was developed by the UNIVAC division of Bravington Land and was released to the users along with the source code and with an expectation to receive feedback, fixes or improvements. It was in 1950s when universities and research institutions collaborated together to work on software. The source code was distributed under the principles of openness and cooperation as described by the then Academia. In the late 1960s, ARPANET, which also stands for Advanced Research Project Agency Network, was developed, which promoted the exchange of free software code over a network. Early 1970s saw the decline of free software. With the development of operating systems taking place, the cost of developing software was increasing. This gave rise to the hardware-independent software industry. The business became difficult to monetize, and setting up revenue operations in lines of open and free software code got hard. People and industries started making restrictive software and charging for each upgrade. It was soon that the world saw the rise of Unix, 
AT&T developed Unix and it was made available freely to government and researchers. However, each upgrade came with a cost. The license also dictated restrictiveness towards modifying and redistributing the source code. The 1980s marked the popularity of Unix. It was an instant hit and it was no more free. To add to aid revenue generation, it became a norm to not distribute source code but only the machine code. One person who was a strong advocate of open and free software started a project called GNU. To mark it different from Unix and other closed software, he named it as GNU, GNU, not Unix. He then started a non-profit organization called Free Software Foundation. Later on, he went on to describe copyleft, which was the idea and the specific stipulation when software distribution that user will not only be able to copy it freely, but also examine and modify the source code and redistribute the software to others. The Linux kernel started by Linux Torvalds was released as freely modifiable source code in 1991. In Feb 1992, Torvalds re-licensed the project under the GNU General Public License, which was an open source license. In 1997, Eric S. Raymond published the book The Cathedral and the Bazaar, a reflective analysis of the hacker community and free software principles. Soon in 1998, the term open source was coined. It was also this year where key players in business started thinking of open source as a business opportunity over simply a social movement. Much of the Free Software Foundation's initiatives were set to empathize of making open source useful for businesses. Most of the commercial software in the early days was owned by individuals or corporates. The legal access to the code was only limited to original distributors or authors of the code. The access to the source code to anyone else was governed by legal protection entities like the non-disclosure agreement. Such software, which is also the counterpart of open source software, is described by the umbrella term proprietary software. This legally remains the property of the organization, group, or an individual who created it. macOS and Windows are some popular examples of proprietary software. Open source paradigm promotes the idea of collaboration and thus high freedom and flexibility. Freedom to distribute and modify helps foster accessibility and rapid innovation while continuously evolving the project. A lot of businesses adopt open technologies to save upon the costs. Being collaborative in nature, open source projects undergo development in front of many eyes and have proved to be reliable and secure. The practice of open source involves a community of contributors which help in the evolution of idea, project and work of the project. We will talk more about communities later in the course. Flexibility and freedom lie in the core principles of course. Freedom to access, modify and distribute gives one the flexibility to put it to use for a huge number of use cases. To add to it, open solutions offer flexibility by avoiding vendor lock-in. This means you are never logged into a particular vendor, their costs, their terms and policies. Having great community support enables continuous evolution of the open source project. Since this evolution happens in public, it is easier for general users to give feedback and good op open source projects often use it to their advantage to evolve continuously. For any system, reliability is the ability to consistently perform according to its specifications. Open source systems offer reliability because vulnerabilities are fixed and patches and new versions are released a lot faster than in a typical closed source system. The fundamental values of open source, especially in open source software, code being open and accessible to everyone might bring in the question of security in open source. However, Simply being open source is no guarantee of security, but being open source helps to identify security leaks and gaps a lot faster and early in the life cycle of a system. Meet Peter. He is a back-end web developer. He likes to create webs. No, that's not what I meant. He likes to create web APIs. One day, Peter decides to create an API to fetch news from across the internet for a particular query term. 
Peter is now able to pass a search term in the request and is able to get latest news about that term as the response. Peter is happy. He calls the project the Daily Bugle. He now wants to show his work to the world. He goes to github.com and creates a repository called the Daily Bugle. He then goes on to commit his API code to the same repository. He also decides to add an open source license to the repository, making the project open source. Peter does not know how to make a UI for his APIs and hopes that someday somebody will help him create an UI. One day, an engineer from MIT named Tony comes across his project. He finds the project very exciting. He sees that the project is open source and Peter is looking for help in making an UI. He decides to contribute to the project by making a UI which calls Peter's APIs. He requests Peter to accept his code to the Daily Bugle repository and Peter agrees. The project now looks amazing with a clean UI. Tony and Peter now decide to bring more enhancements to the project by calling out features they want in the project. They invite others to contribute to the project. When new contributors are brought into the project, to ensure the quality of work, both Peter and Tony agree to review the work before merging to the project. Slowly, a community emerges from this project. Peter, who had originally started the project, was still the owner of the project, while Tony, who had helped Peter set up the front end, was an active maintainer alongside Peter. Other contributors help with writing features and documentation. Open source methodology is a de facto practice. While there are numerous non profit corporations which regulate different aspects of adherence, compliance, licensing, and legality, the practice of open source in general is not tied to any particular one. Open source is run by people and communities, just like you and me. Be it a complex software or a global open standard, people come together to form communities and lead the practice. If we specifically talk about open source software, open source software is typically owned by the creator and the license is provided to the contributors to modify and distribute the software. The associated license is often a standard open source license, which is accepted by OSI, which is also known as Open Source Initiative. When many people start contributing to the project, a community is formed around the project. This typically includes core maintainers, contributors, and external members. Each open source project might have a different governance model and hence a different way to function. With open source, it could be rewarding to put your work out there for everyone to avail and use. Especially in today's world, where the idea of building in public is a norm. However, there are legal implications associated with the work that is put out in public. The default nature of creative work attaches copyright to it. This means your work, until explicitly stated, cannot be used, distributed, or modified by anyone without the risk of legal troubles. In the world of open source, the idea of freedom has to be explicitly stated by a license, which is included along with the work that you do. This license grants other users the permission to access, modify, and distribute the work while also defining the boundaries, conditions, and other nuances with it. Does it mean any work which is freely available over the internet can be considered open source? The short answer is no. Most of the open source licenses today are pretty much standardized. Some of the most popular ones include MIT, GNU GPL, and FreeBSD, among several others. This is React's official GitHub page. If you have not heard of React already, it is one of the widely used JavaScript libraries for building user interfaces. React is an open source project developed and maintained by Facebook. If you browse through the files, we see a file called license. This looks like the associated license for the project. If we open the file, we see that the project utilizes the MIT license. On the right, you can see a summary of what the license allows and restricts. Each license is different, and to be able to make a choice amongst many, you will have to understand each license. This is a good resource to learn more about licenses. MIT license gives users the permission to make any general use of the open source work. This includes access to the code, allowance for modification and redistribution for any purpose whatsoever, including the commercial use.
MIT license is one of the simplest licenses and is a popular choice among people involved in open source. It was a result of a collaboration between MIT, IBM, and Digital Equipment Corporation sometime in the early 1980s. When using MIT license, users are allowed to use the code in commercial applications, modify the code in whatever way they like, distribute copies of the code and make modifications on top of them, incorporate the original code into a modified version with a stricter license terms. Licenses like MIT fall into the permissive type of open source licenses because they allow the user to do anything with the code, which is largely liberal in nature. The other category of open source licenses is called copyleft licenses. You might have heard about copyright. Copyleft is the counterpart to it. Copyleft licenses allow modifications and redistribution on the condition that the license terms of the original work are applicable to the derived work too. Unlike copyleft software licenses, the MIT license permits the reuse within proprietary software too, provided that all copies of the software and its substantial portions include the copy terms of MIT license and a copyright notice. Great! Now that you know about a popular open source license, it is time that you get excited about several others. The MIT license isn't the only open source license out there. You can go to the Choose a License website from the instructor notes to learn about different kinds of to learn about different kinds of open source licenses. Welcome to the first demo of the course. In this demo, we are going to browse through one of the popular open source software projects and figure out how to get access to the source code. You might have heard about Docker. Docker is an open source platform for building, deploying, and managing containerized applications. Compose is a tool that helps you define and run multi-container Docker applications. With Compose, you can use a YAML file to configure your application's services. Then, with a single command, you can create and start all the services from your configuration. So much jargon here. It is okay if you don't know about Docker or Docker Compose. In this demo, the idea is just to explore Docker Compose as an open source project. This is the official page for open source at Docker. Let us try to learn more about Compose here. When we scroll down, we find the project Docker Compose listed as an open source project. Let us try to access the source code for it. If you don't know already, the source code, as stated here, lives on GitHub, which is one of the platforms on web to host source code of projects. This means that if you have a GitHub account, you have access to the code. If you don't have a GitHub account, you can create one for free. To do that, you can go to github.com and sign up for an account. It is okay if you don't know about GitHub or Docker. Here, we are just trying to explore getting access to source code of an open source project. From the right panel, we see an about section, which describes the project briefly. We also see some other information in form of tags, and numbers describing users' interaction with the project. This is represented in form of stars, folks, and watching numbers. We also find an open source license called Apache 2.0 associated with this project. Just below that, the release section details about the current active version and the past versions. On scrolling further down, we see the number of users who have contributed to this project along with some other meta information. On the left, it looks like a preview for a file. This section is describing the project whereabouts. This file is called README and we will explore more about README later in the course. Now, to get access to the source code of this software, we will have to download it from here. To do so, we can use a number of methods. For this exercise, we are going to scroll all the way up to find the code drop down button. On clicking it, we see the option to download zip. Once you click this button, the source code is packaged in a zip file and is downloaded locally. Yay! You just got the source code of a popular open source software. That's neat. Following this demo, there is a lab 
and you have to take a similar path to get access to source code of another popular open source project.